southwest or so is the Hudson Lake uh, yeah, Dark Sky site, which I know a lot of the robots have gone down there in the past. How long has the club been around? God, we just went through this not long ago. We formed, and what did we figure out it was? 79 or 80. 79, yeah. yeah. So yeah. most yeah. of you guys are founders of the club, right? Pardon me? Most of you guys are founders. <laughs> uh, I don't think, I don't think no. any of us that are online right now are original members, from what I recall. Some of us go no. way back. Oh, wait a minute. Ni ni 1981. Hello? Me. Really? Wow. Yeah, I was a member in 1981. Were you? I haven't been, okay, I haven't well, been a close friend, Doug. I, I, haven't been yeah. a, I haven't been a continuous member, but I was a member with Roger Tanner and Doug Nell in uh, 1981. Yep. That's pretty close to original. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah I think uh, Doug Nell sent me an email. Uh, it might have been to the officers. I'm not sure, but. Uh, he, everybody was thinking back, and I think it was they got together in November of '79, and by April, they had a uh, you know drawn up a constitution, elected officers, and uh, things like that. The first issue of the newsletter, I want to say, is a month or so be uh, before that, but uh, early 1980 for sure. Mm. Yeah, it was. We used to listen to uh, Jim Loudon over at Angel Hall. Back yep, in yep, yep, exactly. Actually, you're, you're, real close. you're really close to being an original member, aren't you, Jack, or are you? Yeah, I was there with Loudon and them back in 79, and oh, then you go. Uh, you go to the first membership list, you'll find me on there. Uh, yeah, I, 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 and I stand and corrected. Actually, I'm sitting, but... there's. Does, uh, anyone, does anyone have the original list? I've got some old records, but I don't have anything that dates back quite that far. I've I mean, got I a copy. It's on the lowbrow. Uh, if you go to the lowbrow, okay, members only, where it has all the old newsletters at. There's oh, a really? section. We'll say eighty eighty one. Okay. Click on that. Okay. And it'll be. I think it's going to be. I want to say the February eighty one issue. I might be wrong about that. Okay. But it's one of those two. Yeah, well, I joined in the 80s. Yeah, I joined in the 80s, and uh, I remember meeting at uh, the Detroit Observatory. Yep. That's when we had our meetings, and um, I remember Peter Chalice, I believe, being president. He's probably the earliest uh, president Peter, I remember. Yeah, Peter was the one who brought me on board because uh, we were in the same astronomy class. Okay. <laughs> well, then that, Delvin that, Delvin that Delvin was a um, 84, 85. Yeah, yeah, because in 84, we did the winter freeze out, and I believe Peter was the uh, president then when we did the winter freeze out. I think Mike Potter and him, he did it in 83 when they started it. So, yeah. And wasn't uh, Jeff uh, running the uh, planetarium at the museum then? Yeah, he... he uh, I think I last I heard, heard he was... over to Cranbrook. Yeah. Right, yeah. He graduated, and he got an offer at Cranbrook, so he went over there. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, yeah. And then, uh, yeah. I remember the new houses and their hypering techniques. <laughs> it, um, oh, you go back there, and it's, you go back, I can't remember, Sipes or him and his wife were both members back, way back, and I think he was uh, president for a while. Hmm. Maybe. Pat Sipes or was? Hmm. Oh, uh, it goes back early 80s. It might, there could be another picture, ah. too. Because I think Doug Nell was the first observatory director officially. And then, uh, yeah. Um, I don't know. But, uh, well, for a while we used to meet after Angel Hall. Uh, we met on Denison for a while. Then they yeah. went over to the Detroit Observatory for quite a few years. And, uh, but, uh, that's about it. If you can get a hold of Loudon's archives, they were on the website for a while. I don't know where they're at now, but uh, have a clue. But yeah, he was a great lecturer. Yeah, well, he had his archives. He had the lecture dates. You can go back and look at those in '79 and get an idea. Uh, because we, 
Oh, it was room. It was on the fifth floor. There was a room there. We <coughs> went there, and then later on, I believe it was uh, fifth, fifth floor Denison. Yeah, later on, it was in the Denison. Uh, I think. After we had the meeting with Kirshner, I think it was Kirshner in 80, he was the chairman. And I only went to one meeting. He had two or three. Kirshner? Pardon? Bob Kirshner, the, uh, the um, super chair. Number? Yeah. Okay. He was the chair. He, he's a, we had the one meeting, and it was like a late afternoon, early evening meeting, because they were trying to get people that weren't students, that were the general public involved, because they knew the students were going to be gone the following year. So we had to, I only had one meeting with him, but he explained that there was no, uh, uh, as they like to say, financial line for the observatory. Uh, there was nothing listed in the, uh, I guess you'll see the astronomy department's budget as a line item for the observatory. So, And there we still there. isn't. <laughs> well, there never was. <laughs> There well, never was. Sister. Trust me. We've been taking care of that for years. But uh, a lot, uh, that was one of the reasons they let us have it was to take over you know, general maintenance and things like that. Well, didn't they decommission that in the late 70s? And it was. It was oh, you know what it was? They moved a lot of the scopes over to one to Chile, one to Kitt Peak. Right, the, I mean, from the other buildings, yeah. Yeah, and the 24-inch, uh, they brought over in around the 70s, I guess. No, wait a minute, 59 or 60. Right. And they brought over from uh, uh, McBath Holbert Observatory over on Lake Angeles. But they, I think they only ran it for so many years because if you really look at that scope, it's designed for photography in a way. That's why if you use a low power eyepiece, you get a pretty decent image. But when you try to put a high power eyepiece in there, because of the way the wave is distorted and everything, you really don't get a sharp image, even though you think you should. So that's one of the reasons they just let it go and decided they didn't want to put any money into moving it or trying to fix it. Because you have to redesign it completely. So. But we're still working on that. <laughs> Forty years later, <laughs> yeah, that's all right. They're going to still let us use it. So. Yeah. Matter of fact, in the observatory report, I'm going to show a few pictures I took to out there, just the general area of the grounds. Okay. Paint looks really good too. Real good. So How's the road? Now the road isn't bad. I. Now that the water has subsided, it's not mushy anymore. It's pretty good. I mean, it's uh, still pretty solid. You can drive up there. But I went out there about two weeks ago, just after it was raining the day before something, and then it was a real warm day and all that water. You, 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 car just kind of sunk in the road a little bit and left some ruts. But they weren't as big as the other ruts, I don't think. <laughs> but I, That's good, I, Jack. When messing I got up, down, messing up the first trip up, okay. Yeah. But uh, no, I would, did go back down by the observatory, and on one side by the door, while the water runs out, it was really bad. When I drove down, I sunk one tire in there, so I did go back and have to uh, fix that rut with some uh, yeah. sea dirt, straighten that out. Well, till the till the ground thaws out, you're going to have that mud on top of the ice underneath, so. That's right. Now it should be okay now because I was out Friday, did some more work. I, well, I'll show you on the uh, when I do the observatory uh, thing. But uh, yeah, I've been going out there just taking care of things. Uh, but I do have one thing I found out. Uh, Tuesday, I was in a Zoom meeting with uh, guys from the London Center RASC and the Windsor Center RASC. And I asked them how they were doing their observatory out at Fingal. This is out the London Center RASC. And uh, he told me they had been closed down. They did open it up one day for a select few members only, but that was it. So they're still looking at the COVID thing. And I'd asked some of the members that have been there a long time <coughs> about Starfest. And 
Uh, they said they would not be surprised if Starfest was still closed and not open this year. So I'm not sure how bad the COVID-19 thing is in Canada, but there's another issue of another star party that might be canceled. Uh, they didn't seem real confident yeah, it was going to run. The Winter Star Party was canceled, and the Texas Star Party yeah. is won't happen this year either. Okay, Tex seems to be on. They uh, were talking to me about speaking there this year. That's September. <laughs> oh, well, Okie okay, Tex. Yeah, actually, yeah, the dates I saw for Okie okay, Tex was October 1st through 9th. But oh, it must October be around the new moon there. Yeah. Yeah, because the Texas Star Party in the spring. Yeah. That, that will not happen. That's early. Well, it's time. Yep. You gonna hit the button, Jeff? Uh, yeah, the button is running. We are okay. good to go. All right, welcome everybody. You have found your way to the March meeting of the University of Lowell Astronomers uh, once again online, but looking forward to a day coming soon when we can do this as well as have in-person meetings. Uh, again, I'm Charlie Nielsen, and uh, we will hear from some other officers, and we do have a couple things to discuss. But as usual, we will have our guest speaker speak to us first, so he can get on to other things, probably more important than our chat chat. <laughs> and uh, so with that, our speaker tonight is Tom Field. And Tom um, is... One our, thing, do we, have a, do we have somebody taking minutes? Yes, Adrian. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I volunteered. It's in the chat. Yeah. Thanks for the reminder. Uh, Tom Field has been a contributing editor at Sky and Telescope magazine for the past seven years. He is the author of R Spec Software, which received. Oh, hang on. A little message came up in front of my text here. Sorry about that. Uh, which received the Sky and Telescope Hot Product Award in 2011. Tom is a popular speaker who has spoken to hundreds of clubs via the web and in person at many conferences, including NEF, the NEF Imaging Conference, the Winter Star Party, the Advanced Imaging Conference, and others. Despite the great distances to other stars, astronomers have learned an enormous amount about them. How? The most common method is, is to study the stars is called spectroscopy, which is the science of analyzing the colorful rainbow spectrum produced by a prism-like device. Until recently, spectroscopy was too expensive and too complicated for all but a handful of amateurs, but that has changed. Today, new tools make spectroscopy <coughs> accessible to almost all of us. You no longer need a PhD, <laughs> dark skies, long exposures, enormous aperture, or even a big budget. With your current telescope and a Fitz camera or a simple webcam or even a DSLR without a telescope, you can now easily study the stars yourself, but not just stars. You can also do things such as detect the atmosphere on Nept Neptune or the redshift of a quasar right from your own backyard. This talk with lots of interesting examples will show you what it's all about and help you understand how spectroscopy is used in research. Tom's talk title is, You Can Almost Touch the Stars. And with that, please welcome Tom Field. Thank you, Charles. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, you know, if you're seeing, uh, this is a great group. You really know uh, you're using Zoom great. Sometimes I speak to clubs and people running the meeting, before the meeting, tell people, turn off your mics, you know, turn off your video. And I'm thinking, what? This is a social event. We're supposed to hang out together. Uh, if you're only seeing me as a big box in the middle of your screen with just a thin strip across the top of a handful, then in your upper right-hand corner is a button that looks like that. And if you click on that and select view, you'll see, uh, well, on my screen, it looks like 25 video feeds. Uh, at the same time, which makes it a little bit more of a social event. It's just a, a, a helpful hint. Uh, some of you may be familiar with that already. Anyway, thanks, Charles, and uh, also Jeff. You know, as, as some of you know, there's a lot that goes on to make these meetings happen and to keep a club running. And even I'm looking at my inbox here, 
the folder for this meeting, there's, you know, about a dozen emails that went back and forth. So there's a lot of coordination. I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes here, uh, maybe 50 or so. Uh, and then we can do Q and a, um, I'm in Seattle, Washington, so I haven't had dinner yet. Uh, you all have had dinner, and so uh, if I go too long, you'll, uh, I'll start seeing the tops of people's heads and, and hear foreheads hitting unmuted mics and things. So uh, anyway, with that, uh, I think that was all I had to say. Let me uh, share my screen here, and uh, we'll get started. Let me just get some things arranged. There we go. So how have we managed to discover so much about the universe when, you know, we've barely set foot outside our own front door? Images like this one, of course, we've been capturing for more than a century of galaxies, distant galaxies. And we get fleeting glimpses of a third dimension uh, during a, an eclipse when one thing passes in front of another. Uh, and um, that was me looking at my watch. It was, I turned my phone off. I forgot to turn my watch off. Somebody calling me. So if we wait a while, you can see some stars changing there, like in the upper right hand corner. Um, these are uh, standard candles. It's a, you know, it's the dimension of time, uh, these variable stars. And if we spread the star colors out, we get an as if fifth dimension that looks like this. It's beautiful. Just the colors themselves are gorgeous and the gaps tell us a lot about not only our, our star, but other stars too. We can identify uh, some of the materials that make up the star uh, by the different line orientation. It's like a barcode. I'm not gonna read these uh, bullets, but uh, you'll see examples in the next while about these kinds of things. They say that about 80% of the research that gets done in astrophysics gets done using spectroscopy. So even if you're not an observer or an imager, maybe you're even just an armchair astronomer, uh, still, even though I'm going to be talking about the practical aspects of it, how to do it, uh, the background and sort of seeing what's possible, uh, I think will interest you, even if, if you don't plan to do it yourself. Because the more we understand about this, the, the richer our experiences uh, are, you know, even just reading the literature online or magazines we might subscribe to. So the next slide uh, used to be a list of bullets that I put together, the things that I I wanted to say and make sure I communicated and uh, nobody likes reading bullets. So I skipped that, but we're gonna try this. It's just a ding moment. So when I come to a point where I go, oh yeah, this is one of those things that is really uh, important uh, for me to communicate. Uh, I'll, I'll point it out with a ding moment just to keep us all awake. So a little history just to get everybody up to the same level. We won't spend much time on this, but uh, Sir Isaac Newton, of course, He's the one who figured out that you can split white light through a prism and get its component color as a rainbow. Uh, you can also bounce light off of a finely lined surface or even go through a finely lined surface. And it's just more or less like a prism in terms of splitting the light. Bunsen, uh, many of us have encountered his name uh, over the years. He invented the Bunsen burner here to burn a sample, uh, put the light through a prism and look at the results. And he saw these rainbows with all these gaps in them. They didn't understand, you can see the, the era here in the middle of the 1800s. Uh, they didn't understand what they were looking at or why it was occurring. But the great thing about Bunsen is he kept a really good catalog of everything he burned. And he burned everything he could find. And uh, that catalog really came to service as we'll see in the next few minutes. Kirchhoff was a contemporary of his. Uh, we're not gonna spend a lot of time talking about Kirchhoff, except the one thing I wanted to show you were these two here. So there's two different types of spectra you can get. The first one here on the top, uh, you can see you've got a rainbow with some gaps or absorption features. And then this one, you have a more or less dark background with some lines. Now, regardless of which one you get, uh, the lines, whether they're gaps or emission lines, are going to be in the same position. Now, which one you get depends on things we won't talk about, but Kirchhoff did, uh, temperature of the star and, and other things of that sort. So um, these are chemical fingerprints. You can see different elements here have different lines. So this hydrogen has a dark line in the red that just doesn't exist here in helium. In fact, of course, hydrogen is so common in the universe that we've named the lines in hydrogen the bomber lines so we can refer to them and even given them Greek letters. So for example, this hydrogen beta line, um, let's call that robin egg blue to try and uh, remind ourselves what it is. Uh, that way we'll be able to talk about these lines uh, a little more easily. 
So um, this is a periodic table I created a few years ago. You can oh, see for cool. hydrogen, there's the uh, hydrogen alpha. There's that robin egg blue hydrogen beta. Now, if you went to a flower shop and got a, a balloon <laughs> filled with helium there, uh, the kinds of balloons that when you let go, go up, up to the sky, wherever the sky is, um, if you burnt that gas, somehow you extracted it from that balloon or from the tank they filled the balloon with, you'd see a totally different fingerprint. That's why we call them fingerprints, because they are very unique. Some people say that expression very unique um, is redundant. It, things are either unique or not. I like to think of the fact that the more different things are in appearance, the more unique they are. We don't have to burn things these days, fortunately. Um, here you can see, in fact, I've got one here. Let's see if I can show you. Uh, down here is a gas tube. You can see it glowing there. And it's just, you can see, it's it's just like a, um, a neon gas tube or whatever there. That's hot, that's helium there. Um, or a fluorescent tube. But if you look, uh, let me get my screen set here again. If you look here, there's our hydrogen alpha on a hydrogen gas tube. There's that robin egg blue hydrogen beta. So we don't have to, you know, literally burn things anymore. Uh, a couple years ago, after I got into the astronomy aspect of this, I created this camera here that um, is for educators. Uh, astronomy, physics, and chemistry educators use this uh, either on the uh, lab bench in the front of the room when they're lecturing or even in student labs. It's been really popular. It's been a lot of fun for me. By the way, that poster here, uh, I won't do a lot of bragging tonight, but I uh, can tell you that Neil deGrasse Tyson told me himself that he has this poster uh, hanging on the wall of his office. So uh, I keep trying to figure out how to uh, get him to tweet out something about the poster. He has uh, 13 million followers on Twitter. So instead of my wife and I sitting and rolling up a poster now and then while we're watching TV to ship them, you know, if he tweeted out our poster, we'd probably end up having to hire a high school student, you know, and, and truck posters to some USPS depot. So, so far, all the astronomers I've mentioned have been old white men, like myself and many of us here. But there are so many other people who have contributed to this field and more and more every day. And I wanted to mention some of them here. I think it's important. So Annie Jump Cannon and her team, they were called computers a little more than 100 years ago. They were prohibited from accessing the telescopes at Harvard because of their gender. It's, it's hard to believe. It feels so archaic at this point. Not, uh, not surprising, unfortunately, uh, given history. But so what they did was they examined the photographic plates of these spectra. And they were really good at it. They examined hundreds of thousands of these things. And uh, because they spent so much time doing that, and they also understood the field and, and you know began to synthesize their experience, they came up with a star classification scheme uh, that actually worked on like the predecessors and uh, has really served us well. Additionally, uh, Priyamvada Nataraja, for example, uh, she's at uh, uh, Yale, and she studies uh, gravitational lensing in uh, black holes. Uh, Nancy Grace Roman, of course, recently had a telescope named after her. She was the first astro astronomer uh, at, at NASA. Uh, she got her PhD in the late 1940s. She, she was a big proponent here, you can see, of the Hubble Space Telescope uh, and helped make it happen. So Elisa Quintana studies um, uh, exoplanets and discovered some that are just the right distance from a, a red giant um, that, that could uh, perhaps be uh, uh, harboring um, liquid water and life. And finally, Jedediah Eisler, uh, she's at Yale and she studies hyperactive black holes. So this is a fun slide for me to put together last summer. Uh, and uh, th there's just so many others uh, that, uh, that I don't have time to talk about. The world's changing, fortunately, and women are getting more access uh, academically and uh, we've still got a long ways to go. I thought that was important for us to, to touch on. So tonight we're gonna talk about this, which is a simple, inch and a quarter grading. And this is definitely a ding moment because this only costs $195. So the myth I'm trying to dispel with this slide and with that ding is, and a lot of us, including myself, think or thought, boy, I, you know, spectroscopy takes, uh, it's all expensive and it takes a lot of complicated equipment. 
it can be if you want it to be and if you need that but uh, the examples i'm going to show to you tonight are going to be examples that can be done on a modest meaning even a four inch telescope or sometimes even a dslr uh, with with a, even a video camera, so we're not talking about long integration times. There's lots of ways to mount a grating like this. Just some examples here on the screen. Uh, you can see over here, this is a little a lens cap filter thread adapter uh, for a DSLR that we sell, and then there's the grating there. This is just a stand-in for any FITS camera, cooled or uncooled. Down in the lower right-hand corner, we've got uh, here is uh, ZWO uh, camera, um, you know, a simple video camera can be mono it can be color of course mono is going to be a little more sensitive but as i'll show you an example tonight of uh of a uh, color spectrum and, and why it's uh, much more effective in teaching and in outreach and finally down here in the lower right left corner is uh is just an example you can mount this in a filter wheel so there's lots of ways to mount the star analyzer grading and um, I gave you a preview of this slide a few moments ago. You can piggyback the star analyzer grading on the back of your telescope so you can multitask. So enough about the history, the theory, the equipment. What can we actually do? So if we take a star and put it through our telescope or even our lens on a DSLR and then through a grading, it splits it into a rainbow spectrum. This is what we would see on our sensor. And here's a really good example of the kind of thing. Now, these are all different spectra captured at different times. Uh, and these were captured by a guy named Torsten Hansen. Look, he was only using an eight inch telescope and an older uh, imaging source video camera. Uh, these stars over here are in temperature order, going from hot to cool. In Obia Fine GKM order, these are the hot B stars, uh, a stars and down here, for example, the really cool M stars. You know, earlier I did show you some bullets that mentioned telling star temperature by spectrum. Look at the differences on this temperature um, gradient. You can see that some stars have uh, these, they're not even lines, those are like bands uh, or forest of lines. And this line, for example, doesn't even exist down here. So we can tell temperature. Just two quick examples here to give you a flavor for what this kind of thing is. And that is, first of all, bands are due to the fact that these M stars are relatively cool so that more complex molecules and just simple elements don't get incinerated, don't just burn up. And in this case, it happens to be titanium oxide. Now, again, ding moment here, because I don't know anything else about titanium oxide. The cool thing, and you know, look, we're all big boys and girls now. The, the cool thing is about this is, and, it, and again, there is a myth that gee, I have to have a PhD in astrophysics to do this stuff. I, I don't have any such degree or undergraduate science degree. Um, you learn what you need to know, you know, and if you get curious, you dig down deeper and there's lots of different places to dig if you care to. So these bands are, uh, as I said, on a cool star or a cool object of a complex molecule. Now, the only other thing on this slide to show you uh, is this region here this is what that robin egg blue. So this is that hydrogen beta line. Notice that it's much darker and wider on this star than the ones above it or below it. This is a type A star like, like Vega, for example, our beloved Vega. And I wanted to talk just a moment about how these lines get uh, created so that we understand what these differences are about here. Uh, some of you may recall from the, the model, the Bohr model of the atom, that we have electrons in numbered shells that are orbiting, and sometimes they jump between shells. So on a hydrogen atom, when the electron jumps, and this is all the, the subatomic physics we're going to do tonight, when an electron jumps from level two to level four, um, you get an absorption line right at this wavelength. But notice these stars, as I mentioned earlier, don't have as dark a line. Why would that be? Well, because fewer electrons make that jump. Because on these hot type B stars, the electrons are so excited, they go right past level four to five. So they don't stop here to absorb that characteristic energy. Now, what about this dim and then these non-existent lines? Well, these are cooler stars than our type A. So a lot of the electrons just don't get pumped up by the heat of the star to level three or and up to four. So again, we don't get as much absorption from them. The way I think about this is, in terms of absorption, is it takes some energy to pull an electron out. That's why we get a gap there, because some of that energy is going into pulling the electron out. Now, you know, my wife, she's always talking about dressing for success. And I figure this is probably, I don't know, maybe this is the best place to do it. <laughs> Somehow, I don't think this is what she's talking. In fact, 
I know this isn't something that she's talking about. She's told me repeatedly, this isn't it. Go figure, right? <laughs> so, but you know, you can see there's that bright red hydrogen alpha line there. Um, and if you look, you know, we're all about color in spectroscopy, right? If you look down deep in there, that color goes away and it sort of gets this sort of grayish look. Now I know some of you playing at home, either you or your partner or spouse have been through this the last, what, 14 months. My salon's not open, they're not available for appointments, and, you know, so that gray is just accumulating. But uh, helps on the way, uh, as you all know. Uh, it should be a great spring and summer coming up. So that's the color differences and how the lines help us tell temperature differences. So now you see that crosshair right there. Suppose through some colossal mistake, I got some time on the Hubble Space Telescope. I like, you know, I dream on, I know. And uh, suppose I wrote a paper and I said, you know, we observed a star in, in the Robin Egg Blue area. We think we saw a little bit of dimming. I'm not going to get published, right? That's too qualitative. So to do science, we have to be quantitative. And to do that, we just graph the intensity of this region here. Let's take a look at what it looks like. So real briefly, so this axis is just brightness. Now, some of the starlight goes right through the grating. And again, there's the star itself, undeflected. And it's really bright and not very wide. So that's why we get this peak right here. And this thing over here, well, it's pretty dim here. It's pretty dim out on the wing here. And it's pretty bright in the middle. So this thing goes from dim in intensity, gets brighter, 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 and then dimmer, dimmer, dimmer. But check this out. That little perhaps visible, discernible dimming there shows up as a dip really clearly in the graph. Now we can do science. It's pretty easy. We're not, again, we're not talking rocket science here. You know, we're not, we're not talking anything that's that complicated to understand. Once we can identify that dip and measure what color it's in uh, and how deep it is and it's full with half maximum, now we can start comparing it to other stars, uh, other telescopes, other nights on this star. Uh, it really opens up a whole world. So now how do we create that graph? My story is that um, in about 2009, I hadn't done much imaging, honestly, but I wanted to do some science. And I got a grading and I put it on my C8 here in Seattle. I went uh, just right outside the window here. I'm about three miles from Pike Place Market in Seattle. Uh, it was August. Uh, I, I actually I used a Logitech webcam. I, I, uh, I took the uh, barrel off a uh, eyepiece and, and literally duct taped it to this Logitech, you know, little ball of a webcam. And somehow I got it all lined up. At midnight I came in, you probably have experienced this, you know, my, my blue jeans, <coughs> the knees were grass stained because, you know, it's Vega in August. What do you expect, right? And uh, so Sunday morning, I decided, you know, next step was now that I had this, this literally is from that first night, this image here, I needed a graph. So I downloaded, there were, there were two uh, shareware free programs out there. I downloaded them and, and uh, you know, fed my data in. And after a couple hours, I gave up. It's, it's a little embarrassing. I mean, how many, how often does somebody just say straight out, I quit, I give up. But I had, I had my reasons and that was, it was awful to try and get these programs to work. They were crashing. It what, worse than just crashing. They would crash with an error message that was in French that I don't read. Huh. And I said to my wife, "I'm supposed to be having fun. This is a hobby." So I took the grading and I put it in the drawer. L literally, I did. I just gave up. But it kept bugging me, you know. During the week at lunch, and you know, when I would just had some idle time, I was stuck in rush hour traffic. I just kept thinking about it. So I decided, okay, next Saturday, I'm just going to write a program to create this intensity graph from this. Sunday morning, I was done, and now, ten or fifteen thousand hours later, it's almost done. <laughs> My wife says, "Would you finish the software so we could have dinner at a normal hour?" It's done. I mean, I wrote it for myself, but. You know, a lot of people were interested and uh, it became some, something fun for me to do. So I know better than to do a full-fledged software demo. Like I said, I know it's after dinner there. Uh, I'd lose you, uh, you know, and, and as well I should. It's no comment on you after about two minutes. Well, so I want to spend less than two minutes because this is definitely a ding moment. I think people 
I know people like myself. When we approach, when I approach something new that requires me learning a new piece of software, it's like another learning curve, please, you know? And, you know, but I want to show you how easy it is to do this because I think it's important for you to see that. And so along those lines, there is the software. And this could be just a static fits image that I loaded automatically, it would load from a monitored folder from whatever camera control software you're using. Could be a freeze frame from a paused video, which is what this is. This is from that first night I went out. Could be mono, could be color. Here's the star, there's the rainbow that came because the light went through the star analyzer grating. You can see there a little gap and maybe see some discoloration there. So all you have to do is bracket in the region that you want to study and over here, you get this intensity peak for the star. And then this data here is this data from dim, brighter, 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 dimmer, dimmer, dimmer. There's a deep dip right there. I get that arrow right. <laughs> and there it is there. So that's pretty cool. But so what? I mean, really? I mean, what are those dips? That's really what we want to do is understand what we're seeing. Remember I mentioned that Bunsen in the 1850s, he burnt everything he could find and he cataloged and he kept good records. They didn't understand what they were seeing, but now the great, 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 great grand catalog still exists and is used all over the world all the time. And part of it's embedded in my software here. So let's pop that up. So this is a list of elements that I can come down here and say to the software, would you show me on an overlay on the graph where we would see dips if there was hydrogen involved? And here we can see uh, this dip lines up with that line. It's hydrogen alpha, there's hydrogen beta, there's hydrogen gamma. So now we're seeing on a backyard telescope, first time out with a knuckle dragging software guy, I'm not an observer or much of an imager really. These dips are caused by the light as it leaves that star uh, going through a cooler gas, this hydrogen gas. That's, I mean, this is really remarkable. So one quick cool thing to show you, this is actually a frame that was playing at a, about two, two frames per second is what I recorded this at. Uh, I'm going to um, just start the playback so we can see it play. Now this is jumping around because my seeing is jumping around. Uh, you know, my seeing is changing and it's a little noisy, but the dips sort of remain. Let's zoom in on this one over here. And that dip, especially if we turn the fill off, it's a little hard to see, right? It sort of comes and goes. Uh, this is not a bad one. But I wanted the last thing I wanted to show you was stacking. Built into the software is some rudimentary stacking. When I turn it on, watch how at two frames per second, that feature very quickly becomes visible. Just give it a few moments here. You can see now it's gotten to be symmetrical and rounded. That's our hydrogen alpha line. Pretty amazing, huh? How easily stacking can clean up our data. So that's all I wanted to show you on this screen. It's it's time to move on back to the PowerPoint show. Uh, in your mind's eye, if you do me a favor, if you would record or record, remember just that region. And I hit the wrong key. That's not the key. I didn't really intend to do a screen capture. Uh, if you would remember this region. Uh, and that, you know, we've got hydrogen, alpha, beta, gamma, these reference lines that show us where the hydrogen bomber absorption would be. Because I'll show you some real cool uh, uh, research that was done using that in the next few minutes. Okay, let's come back over to the show and get it started. Now, the one thing I forgot to show you there, I'm not going to go back, but I wanted to talk about doing outreach. First of all, notice, well, this is a gas tube here. They're going to transition into a star. But look at this. This is a star party. They're doing spectroscopy. Look at all the light. This is in Marseille, France. The point, and this is, I guess, I'm, I'm going to skip the bell and just mention, this is a ding moment. I'm going to shake this thing at you. This is a ding moment. Um, the, um, and this is a hot little hat, so I think we'll remove that. Um, spectroscopy is much more immune to urban light pollution than visual imaging. And the reason for that is, think about it, you know, in visible imaging, we're really looking for smooth gradients, lots of detail, aesthetic beauty. But in spectroscopy, we're just looking for dips. So this is the kind of thing a lot of amateurs have gotten into because they can do it in their driveway. Uh, they don't have to go out to a dark sky site to do some really fun work. So um, here's a DSLR image. 
And you can see, by the way, just a momentary, I want to gripe about Microsoft, that they are forcing me every time I come back into PowerPoint to tell it, leave my cursor visible. Don't hide it on me automatically. You'd think they'd make that a sticky feature. I live in the Northwest, right? I think I mentioned I'm here in Seattle. I did Pike Place Market. So I, I have a little bit of a license to complain. So three stars here. It's the three spectra, one for each star. There's a gap. Uh, there's some gaps in these spectra. Notice down here, here's a star. There's a, <laughs> These are lumps, right? Lumps of light. Again, we've just saturated uh, the the sensor, the pixels, uh, that's why we see those. Let's look at a Wolf A star. So I have a confession for the group, and that is when Janet Simpson sent me this, I couldn't remember what a Wolf A star was. You know, I'd read about them over the years, you know, half a dozen, dozen times, I'm sure. But things go in one ear and out the other. Uh, again, a Wolf A star, thanks to our friend Wikipedia, is a late stage star. Um, it's uh, headed towards a supernova. It's enormous. It's a huge star in very, uh, very strong stellar winds. We can see a little bit into the star. So these bright lines here, when we look at these emission lines, these are the intensity of these lines, are carbon here, carbon here, carbon here. Why would we be seeing carbon on a star? Well, of course, stars fuse through the elements, right? Hydrogen, helium, and so forth. And part of that is going through a carbon phase. And so that is why we're seeing carbon here. And um, it's pretty cool we can see that with just a DSLR on a small refractor. Let's look at another emission object. Instead of a star, we'll look at the ring nebula, our beloved M57. And here's what it looks like if you look at it through a star analyzer grading. And you can see here, uh, red hydrogen alpha. This is oxygen. That Roman numeral three just means ionized. It means some of the electrons have been pulled out. Most extended objects are really boring without a slit. So with this, they're boring. So in order to look at extended objects, we need to use a slit device like these. You can see they're like 10 times or more expensive. And now you have to acquire your target and track on a 20 or 30 micron slit. So nobody really starts with these. It's a pretty big financial commitment and it's a pretty steep learning curve if you haven't come up through the ranks learning how to do it the easy way first. So, but here through a slit spectrometer is the Orion Nebula. And you can see, you know, even though it's an extended object, right? It's really broad, it's not a point source. You can see there's some hydrogen and uh, there's some ionized oxygen with that Roman numeral three. So uh, what I'm gonna do just for a moment here is, um, I'm gonna stop my screen sharing if I can find that option here. Uh, geez, meanwhile, you're getting to read my whole desktop. You'd think that I would have done some house cleaning here, but or moved it over to another monitor. But when you give a lot of talks like this, you get careless and, and that's okay, because there's nothing here that, there's never anything that I don't want people to see. But let me stop my screen sharing for a moment. So I'm gonna ask if somebody cares to, otherwise I'm not gonna call on anybody, to share with us, you can just unmute yourself. The first time that you looked at M42, where were you? What was the telescope? And what was your experience? Anybody? Anybody? Bueller? Okay. Uh, well, uh, I'll there share we go. something. Thank you, Adrian. Yeah. I'll, I'll share um, the first time I saw it using a filter. I'd seen it through some telescopes, saw how bright it was. I recognized the pattern of the stars that lead to it. Yes. Then I had a light pollution filter on it, a sky glow filter, and uh -huh. saw it in my backyard. Yes. That was the first time that I had kind of a wow moment, visual, mm -hmm. just seeing it visually, seeing sure. more of the detail of it. That's great. And um, so that, that's one time I remember. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. That's just the kind of story that, that I hear frequently, and it's great that you had the filter there. Um, my experience was a little different than yours because I didn't have a light pollution filter. And so I was in Denver in about 1992. I didn't have a telescope. I'd seen lots of photos of astronom astronomical objects. I went to the Denver Astronomical Society first quarter star party in downtown Seattle at the Chamberlain Observatory. You know, it's fun and it was actually sort of interesting to remember before you knew something, so I drove to this star party. I got out of my car. There was like a little 10 foot high berm that I, I walked up to get onto the observing field. And when I looked down on that observing field, 
to my uneducated eye, what I saw, you know those cannons that they shoot people out of in the circus? That's what I thought. I mean, really, how would you know? I mean, I'd never seen a dog before. That's what they were. But so I walked out onto the observing field. There were uh, people much like some of you or me operating their dobs. Um, I queued up and uh, they were looking at something called M42, whatever that is. Uh, they didn't have a light pollution filter. I, geez, I wish they had. Uh, and so when I got up to the eyepiece, what I saw was probably what you saw, Adrian, in the previous experiences that you had that weren't all that exciting. Because I looked at it and I went, well, so what? It's the smudge, you know, it's mono smudge. I was, I, I, honestly, I was really disappointed. I mean, we get spoiled by the magazines as to expect that kind of thing. But over the years, fortunately, I stuck with it. And over the years, I dare say all of you, in, including Adrian with your light pollution filter, we keep coming back to M42. Why would that be if it's just a smudge? Well, of course, we've got better equipment. We have, what, dark sky sights. Um, and uh, hold on just a second turning that call away. And we also know how to use averted vision, right? So now we're able to observe things even uh, even through the side of our vision, you know, the peripheral where we're more sensitive. But really, I think the reason we come back to M42 isn't because it blew our socks off the first time we saw it generally. I've had guys who went even further than you, Adrian. They said, oh yeah, the first time I saw it, uh, you know, it was in a 32 inch uh, dark sky sight uh, obsession Dobsonian. And I could see the green and all. And I'm going, that's not the example I'm looking for here. So the point of my story here real briefly is that the more understanding we have, the more interesting our observing is. And, and M42 is a great example. Now we know that it's a stellar nursery, you know, a birthplace of stars. And so now, even if we can't see the kind of detail we're seeing here, with our understanding, the experience gets richer. And spectroscopy really did that for me, is, uh, is as I learned a little bit about why I was seeing what I was seeing from reading online, uh, my visual observing and imaging became that much more interesting. So here at the upper top, we can see, upper top, redundant much? See these gaps here? These are the absorption spectra of Uranus and Neptune, also by Torsten Hansen on an eight inch telescope with a video camera. Notice down here, this deep absorption gap, this band of lines. Well, we heard earlier, bands are from complex molecules on cooler objects. Well, these are certainly cool compared to stars. And what kind of complex molecule might we find on those? Well, methane. We're observing here, with a very simple, small telescope, the methane on these planets. It's remarkable that that's possible. So in 1881, Henry Draper of the Draper Catalog observed the spectrum of a comet, and the New York Times thought that was interesting enough to report. Heck, if Hank can do it, so can we. So here is the comet. Down here we can see the little string of gems. And over here, we can see the emission spectra called the Swan Band. Now this was captured in 2013 by a guy named Vikran Agnihotri. He's in uh, Northwest India in Rajasthan. He's a nuclear power plant engineer. And back then he was just learning and I spent a lot of time with him. And I do that quite frequently with newcomers uh, because look, I live in Seattle, so I don't get to do a lot of observing. Uh, it's rainy and cloudy here so much of the year. Uh, now he's, he's way past my ability and understanding. And you know what teacher doesn't like their student to surpass them? And he's certainly done that. Here's a more contemporary example of the sodium D lines on comet Neowise. So now, you know, anybody who uses, let's get the right call out there, uses a C clamp on their telescope and a block, it looks like a block of wood over here. I never called that out before, but that's what it is. You know, that's my kind of a do-it-yourselfer. Of course, I break so many things. I, I'll tell you, really, Control-Z is, is my friend. I love Edit Undo in Windows. And I, sometimes on occasion, I've wished I had that in life. I, you know what I mean? <laughs> but um, I would have broken that camera with that C-clamp, right? I just would have cranked it down, like, oh, a little tighter would be better. I don't want that camera falling in it. Housing would have crumpled. Fortunately, Robin Ledbeater, who created or captured these images, was able to mount a star analyzer on his camera and didn't destroy it. Robin actually uh, uh, designed the star analyzer. He's still around. He helps lots of people. He's on our forum. Great guy. So here is a single frame from a Perseid. And so the Perseid itself is there. 
And then this thing over here is the spectrum and that gap right there is that dip. So Robin was able to detect some of the composition of that meteor. Now look, this is, if spectroscopy is a niche, this is a niche in a niche. So not everybody does this, but you know, whatever floats your boat. So we're not gonna talk a lot about the sun tonight, except uh, you know, in 1868, these two people, um, they detected looking at the sun during an eclipse, they could see this yellow line around 5,800. And they looked, they looked in Bunsen's records, right? Which were just 10 years old at that point. They didn't find anything that he burnt that was at that yellow, at that particular color. So they, they, you know, they shrugged their shoulders and went, well, we don't know what this is. I, my apologies, some of you may know this story. Um, they, they didn't know what they were seeing, so they decided, okay, let's just give it a name. Uh, the name in Greek for sun, the word is uh, helios. We'll call this helium, the thing on the sun. End of story, right? Except 40 years later, a couple researchers were burning an unknown gas and they found the same yellow line right at that wavelength. And they were able to go, wow, that stuff we discovered on the sun, 93 million miles away, 45 years ago, we've now discovered here on earth. I love this story because it, it talks to how science works. It's pretty amazing. So even with just a DSLR, if you're into studying novae, here's a novae with a very strong iron absorption line. You can see this, this nova over here that has no such thing. Quick review for, uh, for most of us, uh, the Doppler shift is um, the change in pitch, for example, that a, the common example is when a train goes through a train station. Right as the train is coming towards you with its whistle, it's uh, right. So it's uh, uh, I gotta get it right. So higher pitched when it's coming towards you because the waves are as if compressed, right? Uh, and then lower as it goes away. And um, the same thing that happens with sound happens with light. So if we were expecting a triplet, that's a great word, right? It almost defines itself. If we were expecting this triplet right here, and instead we saw it shoved over to the right, we would know that it was a red shifted object moving away from us because those waves were as if stretched. On the other hand, if we found it over here instead of where we expected it, we'd know the object was coming towards us and those waves were compressed. Same thing for light as for sound, that's the point. Let's look at a great example of how the Doppler shift gets used by amateurs and professionals. Well, one way super, uh, one way that the stars end their lives is called a type 1a supernova. There's lots of different types of supernova. This is two stars and one dumps gas on the other and you pour gas on a hot surface, what happens? It explodes, right? You get an explosion. So here in M101 is a bright star. It's a supernova. It's a type 1a supernova. Here's a photograph of another one, not this one. This is one that was in our galaxy. And you can see it sort of looks like it has some, some depth, sort of a spherical look. So David Strange captured this spectrum here. And you can see it's just with a nine inch celestron and less than 15 minutes worth of integration time. And he got this graph with that dip. Look, you can barely see it there, but it's quite clear there. And, you know, um, try not to knock everything over on my desk. Uh, you know, they use that, we use that expression, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. The most recent example of that for me was when I got my COVID vaccination about three weeks ago. And I said to the doctor as he was filling the syringe, I said, you know, those drops that are gonna come out of that needle, those drops represent the combined wisdom of humanity over centuries and centuries of of exploring the universe and, and trying to learn the meaning and how things, not meaning as much as how things work. Scientists going down dead ends, whole careers wasted as if, because it was a path that didn't yield fruit, still important to be followed. So we know not to go there again, down to these drops coming out of the syringe. Well, the giants have studied supernova also, different giants I might have than, than life science people. And, they figured out that, well, there's different types of supernovas, stars exploding at the ends of their lives. And so many, maybe some, maybe many of you know that one type of supernova is a core collapse. A star runs out of fuel and it just collapses on itself. So, and these supernova types, whether it's uh, two stars circling or core collapse, all have different spectra. So here is a type 1A, like this one we're looking at. Notice that big dip around 6,000, much like that big dip around 6,000. 
that's silicon. But these core collapse supernovae, they don't have that dip there. So this is one of the ways that amateurs can serve uh, the, the pro-am community, and that is helping to identify new supernovas. Uh, it's a little bit of a challenge because they're often quite dim, uh, but it's one of the things that amateurs do to contribute to science. And we'll talk in a few minutes about some other things they do. So David and I measured this wavelength here on the x-axis. You can see there at 6150. Now stick with me. There it is, 6150. Now if Bunsen had burnt beach sand, silicon, in the lab, he would have at rest found it at 6355, that absorption or emission line. Now, I don't remember the Wikipedia, or the Wikipedias would help me remember the Doppler shift formula, but there it is. And when I plug these numbers in, David and I came up with the blue shift because that shell, that's this shell over here, that shell of the supernova is coming towards us so fast. Who would have thought that we could measure the speed of an object so far away, so distant, with such a simple setup? Now, Adam Reese and his team, you probably recall from uh, just before the turn of the century, they did research that won the Nobel Prize for studying the accelerating cosmological constant or expansion, not constant expansion. Somehow, although I've now dropped it, so I can't wave it around in front of you. Somehow, I don't think they used the star analyzer craving to do that research. I mean, in bang for our buck, we're doing pretty well here, right? If there, it's like, it's a ratio, right? Bang for your buck. Well, our buck is only 200 bucks, so we haven't beat on that. But it's sort of cool that we can do the same kind of science with our gear. What about the spectrum of a black hole? Well, of course, black holes don't emit light, but the accretion disk is the material spirals in that gets very hot and emits light. So David Hayworth observed 3C273, a quasar, and there's a spectrum with two little dots of light. And let's zoom in on those dots of light and look at the spectrum. There's the emission lines, the intensity of, you can see there's one there. I can't even discern the others here, but fortunately the graph shows them. So this guy, Martin Schmidt, now I don't know... Um, I don't know whether uh, I saw a, a parent and a, and a son in the audience. I'm not sure they're here now. I may have run them out being a little more technical than, than age appropriate. So um, this guy was only 25 at the time he observed this or got his, ha his hands on this data. And he, he was interviewed and he talks about it. There's a link on my site I can send you. A fascinating interview about the discovery process. Uh, I mean, he did what, what scientists do. He said, well, let's compare this unknown to a known. So he brought up a reference chart. This is the one from my software. He didn't use this one, but a reference chart that showed the bomber series, where the lines would be if these were hydrogen caused lines. And they don't line up, right? So he was able to go, well, at least I know these lines aren't hydrogen. You know, let's move on to something else. Except they were. So they were enormously redshifted. And so using the Hubble constant, he was able to calculate with the red shift how far away this object had to be. They, the, the big part of this discovery was that this object was two billion light years away. I don't know why I'm pointing in that direction. <laughs> two billion light years away, and yet still bright enough we could see it. It must intrinsically have been, and still is, unbelievably bright. In fact, I think one of the reasons we like astronomy, all of us, is you get those sort of macro views of the universe, and, you know, big and long times and things. Two quick examples here. One is for this to be so bright at such a great distance, it would have to be a hundred times as bright as all of the stars in our galaxy. And the other example I sort of like this, I don't know how far away Pollux is, but I know it's far away because stars are really distant. But if, if this quasar was that distance, it would, as you can see here, be as bright as the sun. It's pretty amazing. What's cool about this is this light, you know, came from two billion light years away. And yet it still has this information in it that allows us to understand something about the object where it originated. It's like that light was timeless. Other things do not age nearly as well. Here's Martin Schmidt a few years ago. <laughs> Now look, I've been justly accused of throwing this guy under the bus by comparing these two photos. But look, he's got a full head of hair. I'm envious of the guy. You give me a break, right? Two more quick examples and we're done. The first one here is uh, 
normally we so far we've been just looking at vega and these features here you know you know 50 angstroms wide or so if we want to look at the details of a feature like this that's our hydrogen alpha we have to zoom in i mean maybe wouldn't it be great we'll just use oh that wasn't supposed to actually happen but <laughs> i guess my mouse is live even here um so <laughs> i'm really screwed now uh, there we go okay escape keyword first time that's happened so we it'd be nice if we could use the roller wheel on our mouse but you know uh, look, a lot of us, myself included, when we first got a telescope and we were looking at the moon and we wanted to see more detail on those craters, we thought, just put in more magnification in the eyepiece. But there comes a point where it's just empty magnification, right? It's, there's just no more information available given the size of the telescope and the air mass and all of that. So same thing here. It just becomes empty uh, resolution if you zoom in. To, to see these kinds of details, you need to actually use one of those expensive devices. So here's Vega's hydrogen alpha, and here comparing it to a known object is the moon's hydrogen alpha of the reflected sunlight. And look, they're not in the same place. Now the moon's not really moving much, but we've just measured the radial velocity of Vega. How fast is it moving towards or away from us by observing that Doppler shift? Now, just a, ding, a quick ding moment here. Uh, I lost, now I've lost my dinger as well as, uh, as my ding, dinger and dingy. But the, um, you know, when I give live talks, at this point in my talk, at some point in the talk, I always like to ask somebody in the audience, you know, does anybody have a magazine, astronomy or sky and telescope or something? Just dig it out and turn to the showpiece section in the back and find some uh, DSO, some really distant object and show it to us so we can admire it and now read the caption. And the captions usually end with something like, you know, this is 18 hours of integration time. <laughs> Look, I live, as I mentioned, in Seattle. Sometimes I don't get that many hours of observation with clear skies in a month. So I don't have the, the skies, the equipment, the skills, um, the dark skies. I don't have anything that's required to do that kind of thing. I'm glad that experts do. But the reason I mention that is that I think the, the, a lot of times when we get into astronomy, we're a little disappointed at first. I bet many of you were like me because we've seen these gorgeous photos in magazines. And now when we see, well, like M42, we go, it's a smudge, like I said. And the reason I bring that up is because with the exception of this and M42 in the next slide, everything else I've shown you tonight was done with a four, six, eight inch telescope. And it's easy. It's not like, oh, this is, you know, I'll spend a couple years trying to capture this. This is the kind of stuff that people capture on their first couple of nights out. So uh, I think it's important to appreciate that, so uh, to eliminate that obstacle to getting involved. So here's the last example I wanted to show you. I've got a little um, um, demonstration object here. This is a rotating star, okay? This edge is coming towards you, and this edge is moving away from you. And so the light coming off of this edge is a little blue shifted, Doppler shifted because of that fast rotation. And the light that's coming to us here is a little bit red shifted because of that fast rotation. So let me, here it is graphically. So it's rotating like that. And this light is blue shifted because it's coming towards us. <laughs> I lifted the mouse off, the, off my mouse pad. That didn't help much. And this light is red shifted moving away from you. Let's look at a fast rotating star like Altair. Notice it does not have that sharp dip in the hydrogen alpha because some of the light that would normally be here has been smeared out to the left and right by Doppler shift. The giants really were giants. Imagine figuring out that you can measure the rotational speed of a star, you know, millions of, of light years or years or miles away. We'll use kilometers just to stay kosher. And you don't need fancy equipment to do it. So how do you get started? Just to finish up here, you need a grading, you need some sort of camera, color, mono, whatever. Uh, mono is a little more sensitive, a little bit better for a really uh, higher end um, scientific aspects. But I like color because for outreach, uh, it's pretty amazing. In fact, I, I, well, we'll get to that in a moment. I don't wanna get ahead of myself. You need software, this is my software. Um, 
R stands for real time uh, because you can look at the images as they come off your camera or in video. And you may need just a little spacer that would go in here because this distance, while not critical, it's not like focus, it, it may need to be adjusted a little bit. So on my site is a calculator where you can enter your camera specs and get some green flags if you're good to go. Or, um, and in fact, a lot of people just click on this link and send me their data and I figure it out for them. And, let them know whether they've got the green flags they need. There's tons of books out there. This is a particularly cool one. Uh, it's linked to, uh, along with a lot of other books on my site. Um, the cool thing about this book is that, look, as I said, I don't know that all the science or a lot of the science, I don't know why nitrogen or helium is significant on a ciphered galaxy, but he not only shows us in an image like this, a graphic like this, what to expect, but then he explains it. So. And this is written for us. It's not written for postdocs or for physics majors. It's written for lay people like us. So uh, there's lots of great books out there. We've got a great online forum that lots of people get questions answered there. Uh, the AVSO, Stella Kafka, their great executive director and her predecessor, Arnie, uh, Look, they're professional astronomers. They know how significant spectroscopy is. So AVSO now has an online database for spectra that uh, you can contribute to uh, to build that library like their photometry library. Uh, about four years ago, uh, I gave a, a hands-on workshop at a science uh, science conference for AAVSO members. Uh, they all had their laptops and sample data I provided in the, the trial version of the software. We recorded that workshop. It's on YouTube. You can download my software for free and the sample data from this link. And tomorrow morning, you could be sitting there going through the workshop, even if you never planned to do this yourself. Uh, I, a lot of people have found that to be fun and hugely educational. There are opportunities to do pro-am collaboration. These are all amateurs here. Uh, uh, Bob Stencil here is from the University of Denver, but everybody else all come from the ranks that we all are part of. Uh, so we've come a long way in the last what, 200 years, as well as the last, uh, well, went a little long, uh, 55 minutes or so, well, my apologies. You know, I wanted to mention one other thing. First of all, at this point in my program, I'd like to thank all of you who are doing outreach, sidewalk astronomy, or going to high schools, or working in an observatory on an open house night. One of the really cool things about spectroscopy I found is that it, by putting this in your toolkit, you have one other really engaging thing that you can use in outreach, whether it's on the sidewalk or you can now go into a high school or a community college or a college and talk to an astronomy or frankly, even a chemistry or physics professor and offer not just, and I, I, sh I should strike that word just, not only the moon or Saturn, but you can set up a live video camera like this ZWO camera on a six inch telescope, uh, not in the brightest of urban lights, but certainly in, in uh, urban locations and show the spectrum of Vega or Sirius or another bright star. This, even though they're not teaching astronomy, physics and chemistry teachers love this stuff. And so it, it gives you something to do. I'll show you maybe during the Q&A, if we have time and there's interest, a video that uh, shows a way that you can actually do this kind of thing during the day if you're doing solar outreach. So I'd like to thank everybody for the outreach you do. You know, look, all of us are privileged. Uh, how do we know? Because we're all here talking astronomy. We got exposed to this and we had the wherewithal, however, to stick with it and to learn and enjoy it. And so by doing outreach, we're paying it forward as well as paying it backwards. Thank you all tonight for inviting me. Thanks for smiling at some of my jokes. Thanks for the outreach that you do. Uh, if there's any questions, uh, I'm here to answer them. And also uh, there's my contact info. There's a contact form on the site. You can email me. Um, I love the topic. Uh, I spend a lot of time helping newcomers and uh, if it happens to be you, I look forward to that. Thanks again. Thank you, Tom. Welcome. Thanks, Charles. Thanks, everybody. So what questions do people have? Just unmute yourself and jump in. Let's have some bedlam here, if any. Well, a lot of the information you gave just went right by. Is it on your website? Uh, the web, Yes, that's a really good question. Thanks for asking that. Uh, there's two things uh, on the website. One is, um, and let me just move it over here. Um, we'll clear that. On the website is the samples page. And a lot of the samples I just showed you 
are uh, are going to be on this page also. So you can read that, and and uh, you know I spent a fair amount of time writing all this over the years, and so that'll give you a good overview. Uh, and the and again. It is, it is too much information, to perhaps, to share and certainly to absorb. My primary goal, as you heard me mention a couple times, is just to demystify it. Uh, it's not expensive. It's not hard technically. It's not hard in understanding. Uh, all of those things. Uh, the th other thing I wanted to show you here is uh, there's a recording of this very presentation done uh, from last fall. Uh, I'll put it in the chat window, and you can actually uh, – you know, if there's anybody in the club who missed the talk or uh, God forbid, I don't think you anybody has the heart to sit through something like this a second time. But if you were, uh, I'll put the link in the uh, in the chat window so that uh, you've got it there. Um, anybody else uh, with questions? Given all the variables uh, about either the position or the width uh, or the depth uh, of any particular line, is there a special process or procedure to figure out uh, uh, which what lines you're looking at? Yeah, a lot of the time, frankly, as amateurs, we more or less know what we're looking for. You know, we use books like this, so we we understand, uh, you know, what what a higher end device might get, and and also we can post it on the forum, and people answer questions there. Built into my software is that little reference catalog, so you can pop up lines and and you know look and see if you get a match. Uh, but for the most part, you know what you're looking for. Certainly, in the first year or two. Um, uh, working through some of the materials uh, that are online as well as uh, come with the software. That's a good question, though, because obviously if, if we don't understand what we're seeing, why bother? Uh, so thanks for asking that. Other questions? Yeah, I have one question for you I'd like to Hi. ask. Hi, Jack. Um, we actually, let's say I was imaging uh, Jupiter's moons. Would I be able to take spectrum of the Jupiter's moons? You can, but you need a slit. This the, you need the expensive okay. device because it, you have to sort of isolate them from the rest of uh, the, you know the big planet. Now, what people do with those you know two thousand dollars slit spectrometers, they actually capture the spectra uh, through the um, across through the rings of Saturn. And they can see the red and blue shift because right one edge of the ring is coming towards you and the other edge of the ring is moving away from that star. So, yeah, you can measure the rotational speed of those rings. Um, but uh, uh, for the most part, the only planets that you can look at because they're compact are, you know, new, uh, new, <laughs> Neutron, <laughs> Neptune, Uranus, and now uh, Pluto. Uh, those are the three that are compact enough. There's a ton of stars you know, I think for most of us, you know, when we look up in the sky, I mean, I've never actually said this out loud. I've been thinking about it because I'm always a little nervous that people – because it, here's the fact that should make me nervous and should make you nervous. You lose five or six magnitudes when you split the starlight through a grating. That's because normal imaging, you have all your photons in a handful of pixels. But when you split the same number of photons across hundreds – of pixels, you lose five or six magnitudes. And that should make somebody nervous. I probably won't present it this way the next time I talk about it, because who wants to talk about being nervous when you're trying to sell somebody on an idea? <laughs> but the deal is that most of the stars, what's new for me to think about, most of us don't think about the stars that are fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh magnitude. After a while, it's like, yeah, there's all those bright stars. There's a couple that, you know, Albiria or whatever, but most of them are just, yeah, it's a star. But with spectroscopy, all of a sudden, all those stars have unique, not always unique, but have unique spectra, which can reveal something to us about them. Or a wolf rayet star, where you can see the carbon and these emission lines as glowing gases. So um, there's plenty to look at, even though uh, we can't look at uh, the planets or uh, very dim stars. Other questions? Well, listen, it's dinner time here, so um, just about, not quite, uh, 6.38 here, 5.38, excuse me. Uh, again, I want to thank you all. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for putting up with my uh, uh, my shenanigans. Uh, uh, good luck to you all. Uh, I, I think we're all going to have a great spring and summer going forward. Compared to last year, it's, it's, it's hard not to improve. Thanks again, everybody, and uh, have a good weekend. And there is one thing, Tom, before oh, you sure. leave us. Sure. 
uh, we like to give our guest speakers either a club t-shirt or a hat just as a little token of our appreciation. Oh, sure. Would you have a preference? Uh, yeah, I think the hat. Uh, there's my address. Yeah, man, I, I can't keep me away from the keyboard when you're talking about freebies. Uh, <laughs> 98118. 98118. There you go. So throw that into Google and you can see my house. Anyway, thank you all. Have a, Oh, I need to hit uh, the interview. One thing, we have two different types. One of them is more of a, a type of baseball hat, like you're kind of familiar with, you know, kind yeah. of tall, structured, has yeah. an uh, just, or, uh, elastic band. Yeah. Stretch fit. The uh -huh. other one is a lower profile, kind of floppy type with a strap in the back. Oh, I think that the strap. second one, definitely. Yeah, I kind of like this too. So you got yeah. it. You know, you thought you were done with me, but I forgot I, I, I mentioned and I'd like to show you because I think it's pretty cool. Um, now you get to see all my favorites, none of which are confidential either. Um, but uh, the video I wanted to show you, two things. Oh, outreach, solar outreach. Okay, some of you have, uh, I suppose, hydrogen alpha filter telescopes. Maybe you do some outreach. You can actually put a spectrometer and use it um, as part of your outreach efforts. So this is a video I shot in my front yard. I don't sell these. Uh, so... I haven't really tuned up this video very much. This is a, it, it's a, a spectrometer. It's got a gnomon. You don't even need tracking on it. it. You know, you just set it towards the sun with the gnomon and just let it sit. It's got this little lever here. And the reason for that lever is because this has a slit in it. So you're looking at just a piece of the spectrum rather than the whole long Roy G. Bibb spectrum. So now with that lever, you can tune through and look at just different places. And we can look at where we'll find magnesium. Magnesium actually has three lines it's a triplet or sodium doublet so this is a bad video but i wanted to give you the, the flavor for what it looks like it's a shameful video it's my iphone held up to the eyepiece it's much more pretty uh live in person but there is the uh magnesium triplet and uh, what i'm going to do here with that lever in this video is just pivot the lever and you'll see the colors change if i can keep the phone in position and now we're moving up into the blue and there's our hydrogen uh hydrogen alpha line there so it's the thing that you can do with this is again uh i wanted to show you the the name of the manufacturer this is uh, by a company called Chelyak. um you could set this up um next to your solar telescope and just have another cue going. And again, with just a little bit of exposure and reading on your part, you'd be able to talk with people about uh, how we learn things about the star. Everything about this is great, except this last fact, and that is they cost about $1,400. So it'd be the kind of thing maybe even the club would buy. Um, and finally, uh, I wanted to show you a quick video of uh, some... Um, Alberio A and B. So this is a mono spectrum of Alberio A and B. And right now we've bracketed in to study the B star. It's a, the dimmer of the two. And here we can see the spectrum. And notice there's much more light over here in the blue area because this is a very hot star, 13,000 degrees Kelvin. Now I'm gonna let this video run. You'll see it jump around because my seeing was changing. There's an absorption feature there and we're about to change the location of those orange lines to look at uh, Albireo A. And here we can see that much more of the energy is up here in this Planck-like curve in the cooler red region, because this is a cool star. So this is another demonstration that you could have going. And like I said, if you have something like this running at a star party, you're gonna have a mass of people who wanna know what that colorful rainbow is that's jumping around. So those are the last two things I wanted to show you. I'll now shut up. Have a great evening, everybody. Thanks for the hat in advance. And um, stay safe, everybody. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Thank it was a great Thank presentation. You. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. So <clears throat> we'll move on to officers' reports. Uh, I've got two things, but I'm going to talk about one of the subjects. Uh, at the end of the uh, other officer reports. But the first one is just to remind everybody that elections are next month. Uh, this year, we actually do have a process of how to conduct the elections online. 
uh, which we didn't have last year because we got caught by surprise with the pandemic. Uh, and also to remind you that nominations are open as of right now and will be all the way up until the April meeting. Uh, so if there's somebody you'd like to nominate for an office, you can just email that in to us. And uh, with that, we do happen to have a nomination. I wonder if Don Foley maybe would like to do the honors. Yeah, I'd like to nominate Amy Cantu for newsletter editor. And I'd, I'd like exchange, to second that. Yeah, I've exchanged, I've exchanged emails with her and uh, she'll accept the nomination. And I think she'll do a great job. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, so with that, how about Dave Jorgensen? Is Dave still there? Oh, there he is. Yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, God. All right. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> oh, my. Noisy. Mute one of them. Uh, anyway, I don't have much to report except that... Uh, Yeah, that wasn't a lot. Yeah, we lost you, Dave. <laughs> I think Dave needs better internet. Yeah. I'll tell you what, we will move on and hope that Dave can reconnect with us. He's so a good candidate for will... Starlink. Pardon? He's a good candidate for Starlink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Joy, anything to report? No, nope, nothing really. Just keeping the Night Sky Network updated. And I will start looking at Google. <laughs> cool. And uh, I understand Joy is a student once again. Yes. So I had to go back to college. Cool. On purpose? How do you do it on accident? <laughs> You'd be surprised. What, what, what field? Compulsory. Oh, no, no, not like an employer made me go or anything. No, it just, the government seems to be throwing money around practically. It's like, okay, I'll go to school. <laughs> what are you going to be studying? Yeah, cool. um, I haven't really decided because there's still tons of general electives to get out of the way first, but I was thinking something computer science area. See, we kind of drug a report out of you after all. <laughs> Maybe. Okay. How about Adrian? Yeah. Well, I don't have anything to report. There's a bunch of stuff I've been doing for lots of other clubs and lots of uh, driving around and doing um, imaging, which I've been sharing some of those. Um, tonight's actually an opportunity because it's KP4 um, right now on the uh, prediction for Aurora. So... That means traveling to the thumb and seeing if I can get something. But um, other than that, doing okay. I know there's going to be a big discussion at the end um, concerning emails, and I will be just waiting to chime in after that. So nothing to report. Okay. How about Jim? Um, I've been looking into the various star parties that uh, many of us have gone to over the years and what they're doing this year. So far, the only, the, the two of the five I'm looking into are committed. Uh, the Great Lakes Stargaze, um, that's the uh, September 9 to 12, and um, the Rocky Mountain Star Stare. Uh, let's see, where's that one? <laughs> September 2nd to the 6th. Um, the others, Black Forest Star Party, Almost Heaven, um, and Okie Tex. Um, they're all wait and see on the... Um, on the virus and what it's going to look like because these star parties are all taking place in either the beginning of September or um, the beginning of October. 
Um, and I'll, I'll, I'm writing up a report on what I know of each one of them. It should come through the email uh, this week, hopefully. I'll get through them all. Because um, I know a lot of people, we, you know, since I've joined the club, we've, you know, got like, what, 70, 80 more members than when I joined. So I know there's a lot of people out there that might not have attended one of these. And, um, they, they can be a lot of fun. And I just, you know, I'm apprehensive because of the, uh, the pandemic. Um, there's a number of us in the club that have been uh, communicating via the email because we all want to go to the Rocky Tex and the end of the panhandle in Oklahoma and that kind of uh, lit the fuse for our email discussion. And uh, I guess I'll leave it there. Thank you, Jim. It looks like Dave is back with us. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm now on my telephone, so <laughs> uh, my, my internet, internet is just uh, terrible. So, so uh, anyway, well, well actually, actually, I really don't, don't have anything to report. So, so. that's that's possible. Okay, thank you, Dave. How about Doug. All right, not a lot of happened. We did. Um, we did get one new member since the last meeting, Dorian. I don't know how to pronounce his last name. It's either Jurgle or Yurgle. But anyway, one new member, and we're up to 163 memberships, and we have $10,131.10 in the uh, treasury. So other than that, not much going on. Other than um, I need to send another sponsorship, sponsorship check to the Clear Sky Chart for Peach Mountain. And I think next month it's going to be uh, the IDA donation, our annual IDA donation. So those things are on the agenda. But uh, other than that, not much else going on. Hey, maybe the club should get a hold of Tom about getting a little spectroscopy uh, set up, huh? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Something um, to think about. We have money, to, like, money to spend. Yeah. yeah, I think we'll bring that up later. Not tonight. But. Yeah. Okay. And I did get his uh, I did get his address off the chat, so I'll cool. be sending him again. Thank you, Doug. Jeff. Uh, tonight we had Max thirty two online and five on the YouTube, and in the communications committee, I'm trying to gather up discussions from the email and uh, various notes that I got, uh, and trying to put together an agenda so that we can have a communications committee meeting. Hopefully before uh, the April meeting, I sort of ran out of time and got distracted with work and other stuff this month. So work. I know it's this U of M thing. They sort of insist that I spend time doing stuff for them. So. Oh jeez. I know. You too, huh, Jeff? Their I sense of priorities. My employer either. Their sense of priorities are all screwed priorities. up. Priorities. Yeah. Obviously. <laughs> but I had. It's the twenty eighty rule. 20% of your work gets 80% of your job done, then you can focus on the real stuff like astronomy. Yeah, that's right. Well, I've been messing around with Astro Berry and other uh, stuff to stick to that uh, refractor, so there'll probably be reports coming in the next month or two here. Yeah, we're, we're finally out from under your last purchase because it's clear now. <laughs> so don't do it again. <laughs> It's all back ordered and it's in the mail, so I've already spent the money. We're we're done for cloudy nights for a while. Hey, now I wonder if you didn't tell us when stuff arrived, would that maybe negate the effect? I can do no, that. No, it's when the moon comes out. Ah. Once the moon comes out, it cancels everything else because then it's out, and then it's, even if it's clear, it's bright. So, so that's what literally make... stops everything. We should have put that in the bylaw somehow that we only buy equipment and time it so that it arrives during <laughs> full moon. <laughs> if it works, I'm for it. Okay. <laughs> uh, how about Jack? Okay, I'm going to make this quick. I'm going to click on my okay, shared screen. And you guys should see. Wait a minute. We see it. Observatory stuff here. We see it now. Okay, and this should be a full picture. Okay. 
Okay. This is, uh oh, not like that. Shoot. Darn. That's your nighttime shot. Okay, here we go. First photograph. Now, last year we did a lot of painting on the observatory and uh, the paint we used was to fill in cracks. It's elastomic paint. So I went out and took a close-up photograph and you should see a pretty good photograph. You'll see some of the pits. But all this area was cracked and split when we sealed it, then scraped, did the uh, primer and then the finish coat. As you can see, it is not cracked or broken. So at least the first year it's held up. And according to the manufacturer, this type of paint will also uh, repel water up to something like 98 mile an hour wind. So hopefully it'll keep the germ for a little drier too. Now, let's see here. Okay. On the west side of the observatory, we had a lot of I'll just say ivy branches and stuff growing here. I went out and rented a 30-inch uh, long hedge trimmer and chopped off a lot of the stuff in the center. I don't know if you can see my mouse going across here. Yeah. But this whole end here all the way over. So hopefully this year we get that cleared out. Uh, people can come back, lay their... Uh, tarp out there and look at the night sky. They were doing that for a while. And uh, who knows, we might even put some telescopes here up in the upper right hand corner on the top if, if some people wanted to. So we'll see what happens there. And here's just a photograph. I was out yesterday rolling the roof back and forth, checking on stuff on the observatory. But as you see the blue coloring and the white paint and everything, looks pretty good with all the work they did for the last couple of years. Taking care it looks of really good. Mm -hmm. And we moved the uh, telescope around the McMath to make sure the bearings and everything was still free. Nothing is sticky or dummy or anything like that. So all in all, that's it for my uh, short presentation. Um, now, as far as any other work in Ant, uh, we're still getting things ready. I've got some other things to do with the uh, roof work, the wheels and the bearings and things like that that we maintenance every year. So, and if things do work out right, uh, this side of the observatory over here that uh, has all these tall things over here, I want to see if I can just uh, maybe knock a few of these down with a little more sky. But uh, there's some issues because the trees are so tall. You have to be really carry which way, careful which way you fall them, so the falling is away from the observatory. A little tricky. But you know, other than that, sometimes windstorms actually do us a favor. Yeah, if it would blow away from the observatory, I wouldn't care. But these guys over here I wouldn't want the windstorm to come down because they're only 20 feet away, 23 feet away from the observatory and they're about 53 feet tall, so they're kind of screwed, so I gotta be careful. These here aren't too bad, you can take these out. Can we put a rope around maybe uh, some of them uh, together so they... they yeah, you, you would have to do that to some of them. You would have to use a rope, and you'd have a way of just controlling the fall so they fall in a specific area. And the other thing to this, because we're on the hill, we wanna make sure we fall them downward because it's easier to drag them downward than lifting them up. So uh, I know that sounds crazy, but when you look at the ter terrain and see how other uh, trees are growing, that's the way you want to fall. Are there so, uh, any dead ones that the university can perhaps be persuaded to put on their to-do list? So I noticed nah, that one in the center. Work that way. The only time that happens on their to-do list is one of them trees falls down and takes out the power pole and he lose power to Stinchfield Woods. That's happened twice. It was in, I think, 98, 2018 and 2019. So uh, that's a little reminder I've used to the certain people at the staff and certain organizations up there that usually remove some of these trees, but we don't want to spend uh, money to 
repair the roof. And plus, it would open up a lot of a lot of observing areas. There. When the time comes for you to do some of this, I've done a lot of lumberjacking. I would be glad to bring my chainsaws up and take them safely. That's fine with me. I have no problem with that because I've done a lot of them already, and I just have to be careful with the tall, thin ones. Uh, some of those are only seven or eight inches in diameter, like a big, tall stick going back and forth. And, yep. uh, you just have to be careful. You want to take them down a certain way. That's the way it has to be. And I'm not climbing on top of these trees to pop them. <laughs> We're taking them off on the bottom. Uh, matter yep. of fact, we used to top them years ago, but as you see, they regrow here. You know, there's a double side, one little up, like a U-shape. So now I got twice as many leaves growing up. So we're going to eliminate that problem too. Just little things to think about now that's going to happen later. Um, go ahead. Just drop me a note when you want to get up there. I'm pretty much free anytime. Okay. Thank you, Kurt. I will. Um, yeah, this is Chris Adams also. Likewise, I'd be happy to help out. Okay, that's fine. Not far away, yep. Okay, we can always get some things started anyway to get an idea of how we want to bring things about and uh, get some plans focused on. Okay, that's good. Yeah, th this is Michael Hagen, I can help too. Hey Mike, how you doing? I'm doing great. Good, good. I also know Mike from the uh, American Society for Quality, for Quality uh, Alexium, so yeah. Okay. Say, so Jack, would you express uh, any issues with uh, Shasia or any other people if they came by and saw the trees were taken down? Would they mind? Um, they've already know we've taken the other ones down. I know College of Engineering uh, has, very, has been open to the idea only because it's the ones around the observatories on that east side and they realize that when they do come down you're gonna have to replace them up on the observatory so so you no. wouldn't expect any difficulty from you about no okay very no. good thank you because uh if you look at the south side i took out those trees about three years ago and uh, you'll see a lot of stumps there matter in fact uh it was hard to put a telescope there could see it all the way up to the top of the hill but now you can put a scope down there and you can observe down towards uh the Sagittarius horizon area in that too. So that's kind of good. And then the west side, we clean that out. So it's just uh, working on the east side. It might be time consuming, a little, time, a little bit at a time to do it though. Um, if we don't have any other questions, I'm going to get out of the share mode. And I'm going to turn the meeting back over to uh, Charlie Nielsen. Okay. Thank you, Jack. And last but not least, Tom. Uh, uh, I have nothing to report. <clears throat> that was fast. Yeah. Thank you, Don. Okay. So the second item I wanted to bring up, we saved it for last because there was some fear that this actually could go on for a long time but I'm also not afraid to cut the conversation off if it looks like it's headed that way and move it to uh, continue it on or move it to some other form so that we don't uh, stay up all night. <laughs> but it's about email. Uh, as probably everybody noticed, we, the, our club in general has a lot of email traffic. And then we have times when it's more than a lot of email traffic. I guess everybody's opinion is different. I have noticed over the last, I don't know, two or three weeks, we do seem to be averaging at least 10 to 20 emails per day. Uh, and we're hoping to reduce that and perhaps make it a little more efficient at the same time. Uh, so one thing, uh, Doug Warshow had reminded us of uh, yesterday, and I'm glad you brought that up, Doug, because I was going to pretty soon, is that back, uh, it was sometime not too long before John Causland died, actually. In fact, he was the one I think maybe actually brought it up, that when people send out uh, astral photos, we all really like looking at those astral photos. So we don't want to discourage that by any means, but... 
there you go. <laughs> but uh, it can lead to a lot of follow-up emails where people are making comments or just saying great shot. And then there's yet another layer behind that where people start exchanging details about the photograph. And as far as the first layer there, we had asked the club and I think we just lost sight of that. And I slipped a couple of times myself. And that was to compliment somebody, even though as uh, Doug Scoble had pointed out earlier, and he's really right, is that uh, from a management point of view, you like to praise publicly and uh, criticize or, uh, privately. So it's kind of nice to say thank you and let everybody know that you said thank you. But again, that creates a lot of traffic. So we'd like to ask everybody again, I'll also send an email out because uh, not all the whole club is here. Just to remind everybody that please, when you're complimenting somebody, just send it back to that person and don't do a reply all. Uh, as far as some of the other things about details, uh, also remember, we send a reminder, we do have uh, an Astro Imagers uh, separate email, just like we have for telescope builders, ATMs, and like we have uh, also with ACNO. So I think that's one thing will reduce it somewhat. Uh, the second thing, actually the first thing that really prompted this was the idea of creating another email account in a sense uh, for star parties. Uh, because I think we sense that that's getting that season again already there's been some traffic about star parties. And uh, if we just let it go as it is, you will find out that as we get closer there'll be a tremendous amount of traffic about star parties and this might be amongst you know maybe a half dozen of it at the most that are actually going to the star party so with that i would actually like to uh turn it over to adrian since he was the one that fielded the first idea and since then we've been all over the place about different ones but perhaps if you want to kind of open it up adrian yeah so reading the emails and reading the pros and cons um the general idea is having an email group where the particulars and the ins and outs of going to these star parties um was brought up uh nathan murphy nathan murphy i think mark depressed is on the list um yes. I know a few of us, Jim, you're on the list, Doug. Um, folks that have attended the star parties in the past have gone to them, enjoyed them. A lot of it came up when I post an image about Bortle 2 Skies in the UP, discussions about the Okie Tech guys that were uh, that are Bortle 1, basically, and then discussion about let's go to you know, let's talk about going to that star party. I intend to do that. And uh, Nathan Murphy came up with the idea. Let's make Camp Lowbrow. You know, he told me, welcome to Camp Lowbrow. And um, then there was some excitement about creating the list. And we thought it'd be a great idea to create the list to where we could send out just information about the star parties, um, who's going you know, as as dates got closer and closer, you know, we would use the, utilize that list in order to um, get into details we that we felt shouldn't be shared back and forth. Much like the technical stuff with astrophotography, we felt that um, technical details with going to star parties would be something along those lines. So we created the Camp Lowbrow email list and almost immediately after creating it and me saying, hey, we've got a list for those of us that enjoy being at star parties, there was some backlash with why do we need another list? Um, you know, going and then a lot of back and forth about what the list would be used for. Is it really necessary? Um, you know, should we have another list? And is this gonna set a precedent for, you know, are we gonna need another list for telescope builders or you know mirror grinders are we going to keep doing those sort of things uh why not use forums a couple members thought about well you could use a forum to have your lists and have people communicate 
And then the issue with that was the forum sometimes gather information that you don't want them to gather. There's concern about whether or not that would happen. So opening up the discussion is, is it a good idea to have a separate list for Camp Lowbrow, um, you know, for star party travel? And if not, you know, what do we, how do we handle discussions like this where a few of us are looking to go to the star parties this year where we're, we're optimistic that the situation with COVID will be in better shape than it was this past year. And, um, and quite frankly, we're pretty excited to want to go considering that, you know, other than, I think Jim, you went down to Okie Tech, Ken uh, Ruble went with you a couple years ago. Um, you know, we've had a whole year where basically everything was canceled. No star parties. If you went somewhere, you had to go on your own, wear your mask. We didn't go as much further than Lake Hudson. So um, any thoughts and ideas? Um, I'll pretty much track some of the ideas and then, you know, seeing how much time we have uh, left, you know, we can come to kind of a consensus about the usefulness of the list, if anything else, either just the Camp Lowbrow list, which I think is a great idea, and I think it should stay, um, or if there's something else we can do about gathering, you know, meeting and discussing things um, as far as going to start party. Kurt, right, so, right Kurt's now, had a stand for a while. We have two groups, or two, two male groups that already exist, which are the Lowbrow Okie Tech Star Party Group and the Black Forest Star Party Group. So, and I don't think either of them has generated much traffic in quite a while. So one possibility that I think might make sense would be just to bring everything into a single generic lowbrow, you know, camp lowbrow male group and use that for all star parties rather than trying to create new groups for each event that people might want to go to. It would simplify things for people who are traveling and simplify things for the people to manage the male groups. I'm, I'm a little surprised that we still have a lowbrow Oki Tex and a lowbrow Black Forest. I thought we had some specific ones for an event for a particular year and then they went away. I didn't realize they're still there. Yeah. Well, I, and I think the thing is the people who manage the group, which are me and blank Jeff. On people, me and Jeff and, and Krishna. Krishna. And now Jeff, yes. So, so basically, we just renew all the existing groups every year. Because it, would you, would, it's. Yeah, would like, you mind sending me a, a list of all those that exist? Um. Yeah. Uh, I got a screen up. I'll send you a screenshot. Who was asking? Sorry. Doug Scoble. Doug Scoble. Um, well, the screenshot isn't going to do me good because then I have to write it down. Um, if I could somehow know so that I can include it with There's 14 all of my them. stuff that I send to members. But anyway, I'm getting off track. Sorry. There's 14 yeah. of them. So. Holy moly. Yeah. <laughs> all right. There's also the Lowbrow Great Lake Stargaze group. Oh. I've forgotten about that. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. I'd say we had let give Don Foley the floor. I think uh yeah. we should do that. Don, take the floor. You're on mute, Don. Yeah, um, I like the idea of having a list for people planning to go to start parties. Uh I don't like the idea of having one big list. I think having a separate list for every start party uh, so that you could just track the communications with the people going to the start party that you're going to uh, makes more sense to me. Uh, but I do understand the uh, complications of managing a lot of lists. So I'll certainly defer to Kurt and other people's idea. I think one big list is a poor idea. Can we do it maybe? Um, by or, uh, 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 just uh, uh, you have one uh, list for maybe 
events during the spring, some during the summer, or something like that. I guess, I guess I'm more concerned about events that are going on at the same time. I'm going to Black Forest. I want to plan with the folks I'm going to Black Forest with and exchange things in that list. And I don't want to see traffic for all the people going to Oki Tex or going to Great Lake Stargaze. Let those folks talk among themselves on another list. I just think uh, having everybody uh, clobbering on the list is a bad idea. From a management perspective, once we've created a list, it's not really a big deal to maintain it, to keep renewing it. It's just people knowing that the list exists and asking to be jo to join or to right. be removed as necessary. So I think if we can get the list and just get it published in the newsletter periodically so people know what's available. I, I can dig up the, the exact email addresses and get that stuff to Doug or and Amy uh, for that matter. <clears throat> or, yeah, or uh, whoever the new newsletter person is so that there's a definitive list of what's out there. I think just they all should have lowbrow dash attached to them, right? Yeah, Camp Lowbrow is the only one that doesn't. It's the only it. one. Yeah. It, it still shows up if you search for Lowbrow. So I'll I'll uh, I'll put that on my to do list uh, here over the weekend and try to get uh, uh, Amy and Doug or or uh, Don whoever needs a, a list of those things or maybe email it out to the group. And I would say they so, should probably, the list should probably go on the, uh, the the website as well in the in the members only. I don't know if anyone looks at it anymore, but uh, kind of belongs there. Yeah. So it sounds like what I'm hearing is that we think we should have separate lists for different star parties then. I, I guess if we've got three already. Done. Oh, yeah, we because we're st we've started those lists, we just didn't know about them. But with it, because they've been gone for so long, or we hadn't used them in so long, so creating a couple more lists for the other star parties that we might go to um, keeps chatter for each particular star party separate. But now, question to the group: Is there chatter about star parties in general? what it's like going to star parties and what it's like preparing for them, what the skies are like, is that sort of general thing of any interest to the, do you think the interest of the group? And would that be something that we wouldn't want to clog our main email list? Or would it be like the, the typical astro photo that I'll send? Hey, everybody, here's yet another trip that I took. You know, that's, which kind of goes borderline between acceptable for everybody to see versus eh, you should keep that in the, you know, this particular group. We don't want to inundate people with it. So I don't know if that made any sense, but what's everyone's yeah, thoughts on yeah. star parties? Yeah, well, I think uh, maybe uh, make them uh, the subjects of uh, future uh, talks to, to the club. Good point, Doug. Yeah. But but as far as, uh, you know, general emails to the members, I mean, we're, we're an astronomy club, so it seems like observing or photography, general type things. I would say most people ought to be a little bit interested in that because that's what we do. Um, I don't think we want to mm -hmm. divide up, you know, um, spectroscopy or astrophysics or you know, all those different things. We don't want to split all those things up into their own email groups. I think anything that's got general enough interest, such as observing or announcing this star party is, is going to happen this year. And here's what you might want, you know, you might want to think about going because we have a lot of new members that, you know, haven't been involved in the club and don't know about these things. They'd like to know about it. If it's in a, in its own group that they're not subscribed to, then they're not going to know about it. So, um, I think general right. things like that ought to be in the, the members email and, uh, face it, we're, we're, we're bigger now. We have a lot more people sending email. There's a lot more email going around. And unfortunately we just, I just don't know what's better, a better alternative other than forcing everybody to join face group or whatever, or Facebook, 
Yeah, faith group. That we'll call it faith group. Instagram is now Facebook, and you know it's like yeah, everything. Well, Facebook. I think the big advantage we have is that we are inside the university firewall with our website and our email, and that gives us a big leg up in a lot of ways over a lot of folks that. Um, and groups that have to, uh, you know, hire outside vendors for this stuff. Um, and then they take our email list and sell it to whoever uh, is willing to buy it. Uh, and I think that's what got, uh, one of the things that got Nathan comparing it to uh, the Nazis in World War II. So <laughs> the... Yeah. Uh, you know, my little project of following the five star parties is partly to educate the, the new people about star parties. But, you know, what's the main bit of research and descriptions gets done? You know, it, updating it is, you know, this year makes a difference because these the information is going to come out in dribs and drabs and um you know so there'd be more emails from me about these star parties than there might normally there would be in another year um and some two of them are going to happen whether you think it's a good idea or not and you know the others are making decisions kind of on the fly um and I a lot of people, like Doug said, haven't been to star parties, don't know what they are. Yeah, and answering uh, Adrian's point a little more direct, directly, yeah, emails and comments about, hey, Black Forest is this dark and it's got this situation at it, I think is appropriate for the general email distribution or about Oki Text or Great Lakes. That kind of discussion is what we're here for. So. Well, well frankly, frankly, I don't, well, second, I don't feel, feel that, that uh, the email, uh, I, 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 I enjoy, enjoy reading all of the email. And if there's something that, uh, you know, it's not interesting to me, I have a delete button. So I don't, I don't have, have a problem with all of this uh, email. I think, I think it's, it's interesting. interesting. That's very good to know. That speaks to Don's point, Doug's point, um, mm -hmm. Doug Scoble, but uh, the point that we share our enthusiasm of astronomy. I think this is where you sort of split visual astronomy and star parties, which have been going on for ages and ages. Astrophotography is, uh, I want to say, a new thing because it's been done back then as well. But um, it's been made a whole lot easier. And a lot of folks, when you get into astrophotography, you get into RGB, you get into Photoshop, you get into um, all sorts of technical talk that is a part of how the astrophotography goes. That may go over someone's head or it may be something you really don't care about. Um, it led to the formation of the AAP group because I think there was a feeling that there was a bit of a flood. What, uh, Charlie, what you talked about at the beginning, I post an image, um, Doug Scoble posts a beautiful image, Ownie, who's not here, posting a beautiful image, um, and everybody going, that's wonderful, created that firestorm of emails. And then even if you, like you said, you'll just hit the delete button but you're hitting the delete button 20 times because so many people wanted to chime in on that being a good image. So to that end, maybe, a dis, you know, the monthly disclaimer to the group might be something we'll have to think about. Um, you know, talk basically saying beautiful images, just please be sure to reply to the sender of the image. You know, if you want to let them know that they took a great image or you have questions. I've answered questions for Amy Ken too, um, because we both like doing wide angle nightscapes. So it leads to personal discussion on the side, which that's what the list is there for as well, for folks to reach out to 
people in the group and they can have personal discussions on that sort of thing. So, so then it, and then it just kind of comes down to helping gently guide and govern how the lists are used so that they're not going out of hand. Um, you know, for us astrophotographers, we pull back on posting something every single day. That's what I use social media for to send posts out there. I don't use the list. Now, something good comes along, uh, like this is the, this is a conjunction or, um, in the case of Jeff, you, your astrophotography improved and you had a really good image of the Orion Nebula. Every once in a while posting it, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, you know, every single day, that's just something we have to, and I think we just consider police ourselves. We really need to post that. Yeah, a little yeah. policing of ourselves probably goes a long way. And reinforcing yeah. what Adrian was saying, it's easy enough to hit a delete button, but what I find is that it's one thing if you're deleting, you know, four or five emails, but when you're looking at, say, 20 of them, it gets a lot easier to delete one that you didn't really mean to delete because there was just too many of them there to look at. Uh, and I found that on some days, I have to admit, I was so busy doing different things that I look at my email and see this whole list of things, and I just look at the title like, nope, nope, and I just start deleting this thing. Oh, wait a minute. What if there was some little detail in there that I really did want to read? I'm the president of the club, after all. Uh, and usually there isn't, but it is burdensome. And that, and there's been many days, I've just been very busy here working at home, and all I hear is this ding, ding couple seconds ding ding i finally turned off notifications on my phone because i was tired of hearing the email alerts well i turned that off a long time ago yeah yeah, yeah that was a good move too. but i i think uh, that's the idea if, if if we can if we can get people to again send out a general interest thing about the black four star parties coming up blah blah but then realize when it gets down to the planning part of it and people that are going exchanging different pieces of information that's when it should be moved over to that black forest group uh, i think the thing is it's just going to be up to us to make that judgment and probably an officer's duty to maybe occasionally have to remind somebody that this is something that probably should move be moved over to the other group mm -hmm. just like doug warshaw reminded the whole club that we had this thing about the astrophotography and i reminded the club tonight let's face it we're going to have to do that every once in a while yeah i think yeah, I you know things like you know short tutorials on email you know not only the you know not using the reply all button but you know as far as individuals managing their own um inboxes you know, how to create folders and, you know, stuff that a lot of folks don't think about because they just, you know, get an, an email, uh, you know, program from, you know, Google or, you know, somebody else that's offering a free service and they don't you know, have any idea of, of all the things they can do with it. Yeah. Um, I certainly don't. And so you know a lot of the problem i think that people have and it certainly makes my day go a lot more slowly is i simply don't organize the stupid emails so yeah. that i can go into you know the lowbrow folder and that's <laughs> where all that stuff will be and i i find know, I uh be missing it by accident i find a lot of value and google has a a, a labeling feature <laughs> Uh, it can be thought of as a folder uh, feature, but uh, labeling stuff based on filters and just creating those filters, that's immensely yeah. valuable because it can instantly classify, you know, things that are coming in that maybe you don't need to read out uh, immediately or whatever. If it's coming from the AP list, then it's like, yeah, I can read that later. So I maybe uh, you, you got a good point there, and I wrote it down as a to-do list, just a, a quick tutorial on you know some basic email techniques to deal with the mass, and maybe it deals with folders, filters, and you know uh, when to use reply all if you don't want to spam the rest of the planet. So 
Thank you, Jeff. Maybe, yeah, maybe we need yeah, a, maybe Jeff, we need a maybe we need a uh, how to use email email list. I'm going to meet Doug. Um, actually, coming from your office, Jeff, that I think would be perfect. Come, that's communications it, chair stuff right there. It, it seemed so, to be um, kind of falling into my ballywick there. So, <laughs> yep, I think that's perfect. Well, before we close the discussion, um, there's a few that haven't spoken out, but um, I say we give you all the chance right now. Anyone else have any thoughts or comments about emails? Chris. Yeah, so I do. Uh, I actually agree with some of the things that I've been hearing, and I already use some of the techniques that you were just talking about. Uh, created a lowbrow folder, for example, and I see something come across that has a interesting subject on it. I just send it over to the lowbrow folder to read later. Um, a lot of them I still haven't read, but uh, um, I was also going to say that I've experienced some of what you're talking about uh, in general in the sense that sometimes I'll get a lot of emails on one subject and I just end up going delete, 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 delete. As soon as I see the subject is something I'm not generally interested in right now. Um, and um, there was something else I was going to say too. Uh, Anyway, it's escaping me right now, but uh, if I think of it, I'll chime in later. Or shoot us an email on it. You know, that yeah. would no problem. Uh, I well, have that's one thing question. I was going to say. Is, yeah, so one thing I was going to say is uh, I, uh, I think I inadvertently contributed to some of this about a month ago myself. I hauled off and posted a picture and sent it uh, of the uh, radio telescope. And I remember after I took that picture of the radio telescope, I was uh, showing my wife. I said, look at this. Look at this. It's almost being used as a poster child for all the problems associated with the antenna that they're looking at putting up on Peach Mountain. I was flabbergasted because all I did was take, post a picture of, a, uh, of the radio telescope from Madden Road. And it prompted a thread that lasted for another two weeks afterwards, and I didn't, I couldn't understand why all the discussion around the antenna. But anyway, um, yeah, it, I'll leave it at that. It's hard to control. Those are good thoughts. It's hard to control when something's going to go viral. It's, you can't really predict yeah. it. It's just how people are feeling and if they're ready to yeah. pile on on that day. So those things do happen. So I've got a good comment. comment. I've got a comment that turns into a question, but uh, uh, for my work, I've in there, I've got all kinds of subfolders uh, for different emails from different customers, so I can kind of track what's going on. And that all works pretty well. It's a matter of me having to physically place emails from my inbox into those other folders, so it's maybe, it's just an organization thing. But what I'm wondering is anybody that has created folders like that and put rules on them as far as what email would come into that box, I'm curious how reliable that is. And I ask that because this is one of the things that irritates me about Gmail at times yeah. is sometimes it'll just make arbitrary decisions. Uh, I can think of, oh, maybe a year or so ago, I had a rather important email from a customer or reply and they kind of wondered, uh, they were patient about it, but when I finally got back with them, they wondered where I'd been at. And that was because Gmail just decided to throw it in some folder other than the inbox. And I think I found it under start or important or something. I didn't do that. Uh, and this has happened more than once. Or I'll find an important email that's thrown over in promotions, uh, things like this. So I'm just wondering if you're setting your own filters of people have done that have this that been pretty reliable or have you witnessed that I mean, I, Charlie I've been using Gmail for many 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 years and I've got different things uh, that, that label certain things and I do it by sender actual address and for me it's been really really reliable the exception of that is once in a while things will end up in spam and it thinks of spam that 
I looked and I said, how did this end up in spam? And then it just says, well, this resembles something that we've seen in other, you know, emails right. that are considered spam or reported as spam when I've never reported it as spam. It's important stuff. And, uh, you know, I've got three emails through Google. I've got one for low browse only. I've got one for my own personal professional. Now that I'm retired, it's, you know, not that much. But uh, then when I share with my, uh, my wife and, um, for me, it's been very, it's been pretty reliable as far as setting up labels. But you have to be careful. Don't use keywords. Uh, use more like real sender addresses or uh, things mm -hmm. like that. And it'll tend to uh, yeah. tend to work pretty good, at least in my experience. All right. Um, any other comments? We're at nine thirty, so yeah. I'm thinking we should be getting close to wrapping yeah, up. Like I think I smell resolution to this whole thing, so. Don't Just one thing I wanted to uh, 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 pick, uh, uh, put forth. Uh, some of the people who are club uh, uh, post a lot uh, more pictures than others. And one of my problems is, uh, especially when they use similar uh, subject lines, that I can't tell whether or not uh, it's, uh, I'm seeing the same uh uh, email just being commented on several times, or it's a different, it's a new email from the same person. Mm -hmm. That's also uh, slowed things down for me. So, Doug, could you stay yeah. online after everybody else signs off? Doug Warshaw? Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. So, so the couple of ideas we had, um, all of them are very good. The Camp Lowbrow, I think, uh, has a sentimental ring to it where you know it's the the grizzled groups of veterans that are going here and there to star parties and um i like the idea however don's point um and then kurt you mentioning that once an email list is created it's just there um having different email lists for each star party and that way everyone just if you want more information on a particular star party you can ask to join those particular lists or be a part of all of them um, if you're going to all of them. So those are the ideas that I think we came up with. I think they're pretty good ideas. And I like the idea of not being afraid to share a topic to the main list using some discretion if it starts to pick up steam and we're starting to get emails to have someone, maybe Jeff, or a VP say, we're moving, let's move this list to somewhere else or offline. It's beginning to clog the email. So I think that's the direction we're heading. But um, I'm going to take all that info and throw it to my left, or your right, to uh, our esteemed president to tell us where we're going next. So back to you. Hey. I, I do have one question for Doug Scoble. Um, do you have the banner or do I have the banner? I haven't oh. looked. You know, it's been two years now and I haven't looked. I do not have the banner. So I, I can guarantee I, you that. I figured somebody you needs to print that no. banner. Okay. Um, That's fine. That's I, one of the. We'll make that an action item to find the banner. Yeah, for Camp I don't Lowbrow. remember. You know, it is someone that went to the last. So you went to Okie Tech, what, in 19 or 18? Uh, I, can't see, I can't see yes, all the way yes. down on your shirt. <laughs> but anyway. Go. There it is. The 36, 36 Okie Tech. 19. Okay. So I gave it to someone to take to that. And where it went from there, I don't know. But I certainly do not have it because when I moved, I went through virtually everything. Yeah, I figured it would be easier yeah. for me to ask you rather than me yeah. go through all my crap. Yeah, yeah. Like there is one more point. We have to track down the banner. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, there is one more point. I don't. Item. Yeah, I don't want it to become lost before we sign off. Um, the individual, you know, Black Forest email list, the individual Oki Text email list. Once discussion discussion gets to the point of when are you leaving, what food are you taking, what route are you taking, you know, when do you plan on coming back, you know, what what all that kind of stuff, that belongs on a star party specific 
email list, in my opinion. Either that or a reply to all, and you keep track yourself of all the people that you know are going with you. Um, I don't think things like that need to be clogging up a clogging up. I agree. I've been using email forever. Yeah. Yeah. I but, feel like uh, if you're close enough with someone to tell them your camping plans and stuff, you should probably be texting them. <laughs> if you don't have their number, then you know yeah. it should be a group chat text. You text it to one person, yeah. it goes to all six of you or whatever. Yeah, that's yeah. that's the modern way of doing it. And uh, when was my last start party? I don't remember, but probably 2015. Black Forest was my last one. But, uh, yeah, that's a point, too. But, anyway. Yeah. Don't want this discussion so it's to one, it's a It's a way, you know, yeah, we take it offline to email or no, to text. Um, up until that point, email might be easier for members. And then it's like a week from everybody leaving. Then we're all, you know, then we're all at that point. Um, and certainly, one, good point. certainly once you're on the road, once you're on the road, then you're texting and all that. Yeah. And that's what we've you, always done. So you get everyone's name and number and do it that way. So. Okay. I think we uh, we have a track to follow here. So with that, does anybody have anything else? Okay. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. I do. Support? Second. All in favor? Okay. Thank right. you very much, right, everybody. Let's, let's go to Pizza House. Right. <laughs> uh, we will be sooner or later. Say Doug. Say Doug. Doug. Say Doug. Doug. Pizza Doug. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just wait yeah, a second. Yeah. My uh, my first vaccination is coming March twenty, March twenty third. Second one is like got, three weeks in April. I got Monday over at the Kroger across from U of M. Yep. <laughs> I had my first. Yeah, I got first one. I get my second one. Oops, sorry. I had my first one. I get my second one on April first. No fooling. 